Welcome everyone to the webinar, Multi-Cloud Strategy, A Necessary Evil for an Enterprise by Rashmi Tambe and Sunit Parekh. So without any further delay, over to you, Rashmi. Thank you a lot. I'm just sharing my screen. Thanks everyone and thanks to Agile India for hosting us. Um, today, myself and Sunit Parekh, we will be talking about Multi-Cloud Strategy. Uh, both of us are part of ThoughtWorks. Uh, we work, uh, we are part of a service line which focuses on enterprise modernization, clouds and platforms. Um, and without, we have a packed agenda. So without further ado, uh, let me quickly go through the agenda. So we'll first start with um, demystifying the multi-cloud deployment model, because when you hear the term multi-cloud, uh, it actually means many things. And uh, based on our experience of working with many clients, we realize that uh, they mean many overlapping things when they say that they're looking at multi-cloud. So we realized that you know it is really important to demystify the terms and to really uh, define what what does it actually mean by multi cloud? What are the various flavors of multi cloud? Then we'll uh, understand what does the industry say about multi cloud? Or why are the enterprises um, embracing multi cloud? What are the key business drivers? Uh, but what are the challenges? While uh, most of the enterprises are going towards multi cloud, there are there are challenges. Multi cloud is hard. It's complex. So what are the challenges in the journey? And finally, in order to uh, build a successful and a sustainable multi-cloud strategy, what is our approach? What is it that ThoughtWorks proposes uh, based on three core tenets, uh, ev evaluating your workload, defining a multi-cloud operating model, and governing uh, your multi-cloud environment? So these are the three core tenets of our multi-cloud strategy. And finally, you know, we'll, we'll come to the summary of it. So let's first start with the the multi cloud models. What does you know? What do clients actually mean when they say they are looking at multi cloud? So journey to cloud for any enterprise usually starts with mono cloud. Uh, straightforward term mono cloud means one cloud. Uh, when the enterprises are in in the very early stage of their cloud journey and looking to uh, a particular public cloud provider for uh, migrating their workloads, then uh, it's called mono cloud, which is just one cloud. Uh, hybrid cloud, which is uh, when the workloads are running in combination of your on-premise infrastructure uh, as well as your uh, public cloud infrastructure, then you're looking at a hybrid cloud uh, setup. Uh, now things get really, really interesting when you're looking at more than one uh, public cloud provider. This is what is called as a polycloud strategy. It's a start of uh, your you know, true multi-cloud journey where you're looking at more than one uh, public cloud providers. And uh, usually the enterprises choose a particular cloud provider based on various factors like uh, various features and services provided by that cloud. Uh, this service availability in the particular uh, geo latency, et cetera. So workload going to either one cloud or another, depending on these factors, uh, and the guidelines uh, for deciding this is what we call as a polycloud strategy. Then comes portable cloud. Um, this is a, a very, very um, you know, a complex, uh, or I would say a little bit of a deliberate choice uh, when enterprises are looking at business critical applications to run across two clouds in order to ensure the uh, continuity of the business in order to ensure the high availability they are looking at portable clouds so the same workload which is a uh, very uh, high business critical workload running in two clouds uh, either in active active mode or active passive mode uh, in a in a typical a dr setup uh, that's what we call as a portable cloud. The reason it is portable is, is because the, the workload has an ability to run on any cloud and it has a cloud agnostic application architecture. So if it's, if it's required to move the workload from one cloud to another public cloud, uh, it is, uh, there are obviously efforts in, uh, uh, involved, but it is possible to do that. And that's why it's called portable cloud. And last but not the least, uh, distributed cloud. Uh, this is the most, uh, you know, complex or, you know, uh, it's a geographically distributed setup of 
your the workloads across you know your on premise setup across multiple public private clouds um, uh, workloads running on edge all of this is centrally managed by one public cloud provider uh, what does it centrally managed means is being able to do uniform uh, policy enforcement and compliance being able to monitor and manage these environments from one public cloud provider uh, that this is what is called as a distributed cloud uh, you can think of, uh, for example, um, Google has an offering, uh, GCP and Thos Distributed Cloud, uh, which helps uh, customers do this, which, you know, it has a central way of managing workloads which are running across uh, multiple cloud providers on-premise or on-edge, etc. So uh, before I move on, um, in the chat, uh, you will see a poll. Uh, we would like to understand from you uh, based on, uh, you know, the the uh, scenarios in your enterprises. You know, what do you see most common? Uh, and it could be multi-choice. You know, you might have seen um, both hybrid poly or hybrid poly portable, etc. So let us know what are the typical scenarios that you have come across. Okay. So moving on. Um, so multi-cloud, you know, the, the reason why we have named this session as, you know, uh, it's a necessary evil for enterprise. And we don't mean evil uh, in, a, in a, a necessarily negative way. Why evil we mean? It is complex. You know, it's, it, is, uh, it requires certain set of skills, certain set of um, uh, maturity and capability to be able to uh, you know embark on the multi cloud journey and have a sustainable multi cloud journey and that's why you know uh, we, we call it as a necessary evil for enterprise so as you see from from your data center to mono cloud hybrid poly portable and distributed uh, the complexity and the maturity in, you know you have to have more maturity in the organization in terms of uh, in terms of skills in terms of capabilities in terms of budget cxo backing backing because the journey gets more and more complex and this is where we advise a lot of clients. For example, we were working with one of the telecom providers in Southeast Asia uh, who, uh, who has been working on AWS and looking at GCP as their other cloud provider. Uh, it, when, when they came to us, they directly started talking about a portable cloud, you know, having, having uh, work, ability to run the workloads across clouds. And we showed them this and we told them that, hey, you don't necessarily need that. Do you really have business critical applications with the very high availability requirements? And uh, you pro probably mean poly cloud because you, are, you want to choose which when to use AWS and GCP for your workloads. And that's why, you know, it's important, you know, to, to and, and that's where we help clients based on what their objectives are, uh, how, how it gets really complex and what kind of deployment model you should choose for the kind of workloads you have. So let's quickly look at what is the industry uh, saying about multi-cloud. Uh, you'll see um, some numbers here. Uh, these numbers are from renowned industry analysts. For example, there's a number from IDC, uh, which says 81% of, of uh, enterprises are looking at uh, multiple public clouds. Uh, State of cloud report from Flexera says 89% of enterprises have multi-cloud strategy. So uh, the number is same from Gartner. Uh, what is interesting is that these, you know, these numbers are across the flavors that we saw in the earlier slides. Uh, for example, uh, when Flexera says 89% uh, have multi-cloud strategy, uh, within that 89%, actually they're saying that 80% have a hybrid cloud strategy. So these numbers are, uh, you know, these are mixed, but but it sets a trend that in the industry, uh, it is becoming necessity mostly for large uh, enterprises to look at multi-cloud environments. So the 89% number that you saw, the Flexera state of the cloud report, it says 89% uh, enterprises have a multi-cloud strategy and 80% have a hybrid cloud strategy. So this is just a distribution of that 80%. When, when they say we have a hybrid cloud strategy, for example, 48% of them have, which is pretty large number, half of them are saying that we are looking at uh, multiple public and multiple private. So the private could mean on-premise plus a private cloud um, uh, setups. 31% uh, says multiple public and one private. So you, you'll see all more than, uh, you know, more than three-fourths of these enterprises are dealing with multiple uh, public cloud providers and private cloud providers. And, and that's how these numbers are distributed. So, so why why is this number so high, and why 
the uh, enterprises uh, you know when when we know that multi cloud is complex it's it re really requires maturity what is it that is you know driving these enterprises to go to multi cloud so some of the key key drivers uh, for example uh, that we we are not listing all of them uh, i'm going to talk about four key drivers here uh, based on the the use cases that we have seen for example uh, leveraging best of breed services from multiple cloud providers um in our experiences we've seen that uh, a typical example uh, wherein the clients are embracing gcp for running um, their data and machine learning workloads and aws for containerized workloads uh, this, so this depends on you know for, for example um, uh, you know you, you choose a particular cloud and this is what polycloud strategy is you choose a particular slide cloud for a particular set of uh, or particular types of workload depending on the 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 features or services that are provided by by that cloud provider so if you are already an aws or azure shop you may be looking at gcp for running your data workload just one example there could be many such examples okay uh, other other uh, reason that we have seen is to manage vendor lock in uh, and this is especially uh, very relevant for large enterprises who are looking to hedge their business risk they do not want to completely uh, depend on, on one particular cloud provider and they also want to leverage um, uh, across cloud providers to to negotiate their their, uh, their billing charges etc so that's why this is especially required for large enterprises to look at multiple cloud scenarios to manage uh, to avoid the vendor lock in because then that increases your business risk to multifold that if you're completely your if all your business critical applications are running on one particular cloud provider uh, you know it it increases the business risk uh, other uh, use cases that we have seen is addressing the business continuity uh, for example in india uh, one of the la largest banks that we are working with uh, who's running their um, their uh, banking and lending platform on aws is looking at uh, gcp as their uh, uh, dr cloud for the business continuity and this is also uh, true because of some of the policy uh, guidelines that are coming up uh, from rbi uh, especially if the banks are running work workloads in cloud they need to have a dr capability on another cloud uh, other scenario that we have seen is to manage competition this is true for many of the online retail companies wherein uh, initially when they embraced cloud they went ahead with aws but now amazon being their key competitor in online retail they are looking at other cloud options like aws and azure uh, sorry uh, looking at azure and gcp uh, as as a second cloud provider to address the the competition aspect of it because they are in the same business as amazon and last but not the least um, there are some geopolitical dynamics uh, for example multinational companies when they do uh, mnas in other regions maybe the other company is running on other cloud sometimes there are uh, country specific data residency requirements because of which they need to consider another cloud uh, other the reason is for example china as part of their uh, digital silk route um, uh, initiative uh it is uh, it has plans of putting uh, more than 1 million companies on cloud in areas like saudi arabia laos uh, turkey etc so uh, multinational companies who are operating in these regions have to look at multi cloud as an option uh, if they want to be relevant in in those uh, particular uh, geographies okay. so i'll take a pause here again you will see another um, another question in the chat and we would like to hear from you what are the key business drivers that you have seen out of all of this or if you think uh, your business driver doesn't fall into this please let us know by answering the question in the chat again a multi choice question uh, what what sort of business drivers that you have seen in in your enterprises uh, of people embracing multi cloud okay so with that uh, sorry there's one more slide um so um as i was saying earlier we uh, the these are you know uh, the key business use cases for multi cloud that we have seen are in our experience it is poly cloud which is choosing a cloud for a type of workload as well as disaster recovery for business continuity uh, some of the other uh, and it also matches with with uh, this this um, uh, statistics that comes from flexera state of the cloud report uh which is you know dr failover apps on different cloud uh, which is a polycloud strategy 
Um, and then there are other use cases like uh, integration across clouds, workload, mobility across clouds, which is the portability part of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this, this this is exactly what we have also seen. And these two are the top two use cases um, uh, with, that we have seen in our experience. So with that, uh, I will stop the share and I will uh, invite Sunit to talk about the next section. So I think we have understood uh, from the discussions that we had so far that multi-cloud is the necessary for every organization now because of many drivers, business drivers that uh, we end up in choosing more than one cloud service providers, right? And to start that journey, we first need to understand what are the challenges in, in adopting the multi-cloud strategy. So let's look at those challenges first and then go into the next, which is the strategy or the solution part of it, right? So the first challenge in adopting the multi-cloud strategy is that how we are going to provision our infrastructure and manage them across the cloud service provider, right? And I think we have been doing some ad hoc cloud formation templates and all that so far, but now we have to think about a proper way to manage them. There are really good tools available nowadays like Terraform, Pulumi and all that, but still we need to have that proper uh, cross-platform uh, provisioning strategy for us, right? So that is the first challenge that it starts with. Second, once we have this out of the box, the second challenge is having the uniform security and compliance policy rollout. This is very important for large organizations to not get into some defaults and compliance issues, right? And security has been one of the primary uh, threat to moving to cloud. So if you don't have a uniform security across cloud service providers, it's going to put you on the backseat again. So this is another challenge that, okay, we figured out how to do all the security and compliance stuff on one cloud service provider. Now you have to go and put it on the another. You have a different tool set, different ways to implement the actual security. Uh, some securities are provided by the cloud service providers, some are not, all that complexity starts creeping in. Then comes the application. So you got the infrastructure setup, security setup, uh, maybe, and then comes the application, right? Now, if you have to build the portable apps across CSPs, how you are going to have your architecture, which is cloud agnostic, right? And all that is going to play the role there. Moving on. Application is set up across, but then to work them, we need to have a data replication availability across the stateful workloads, right? If you have a, let's say Redis cluster in one of the uh, cloud service provider, how you replicate across if you have to put the caches there, right? If you have a database, how you replicate? If you are using poly cloud, so application is running on one of the cloud and your data workloads are running on the another cloud, you have to move this data across, right? So you have to replicate the data into the another cloud. So all that needs to be sorted out. Then comes the network topology, how you are going to connect your network from on-prem to your cloud service providers from the public coming to the actual cloud service providers. You need to set up at both the places. And to do all of this, you need to have an in-house or vendor based a skill and capability management, right? You need to now have capability for both or multiple cloud service providers. And you need to think about how we can have a fungible uh, peoples who can go across and work across multiple cloud service providers. And the last, once we have set up, we got the skills done. The last challenge is the cost. We need to now manage cost and optimize resources usage across the multiple cloud service provider. Now, these are the key or the list of the challenges that you will get into once you start adopting the multi-cloud strategy. Here, we have tried to put the one view of increased effort and complexity. So with cross-platform infrastructure service, uh, infrastructure provisioning, your efforts and complexity increases, but this problem is kind of solved in, in a way with help of Terraform and Pulumi and all those tools, right? Security and compliance policy rollout becomes more difficult and challenging because every 
CSPs have their own tools. Tools like open policy agent and all that will help you further there. So similarly, we go on for the each list and your capability development within the organization is going to be major challenge. And that's where your significant increase in effort and hiring and having people across is going to be required, right? So this is the map of the effort and complexity increase across different challenges. With that, I would like to move to the next part. So we looked at the different deployment models of multi-cloud. We looked at the uh, drivers for adopting multi-cloud. We looked at challenges for adopting the multi-cloud. Now comes the approach to build your own multi-cloud strategy. So we have been working with many clients, customer over last many years and come with some structured way of solving this problem. And that has helped us uh, a lot. And we are sharing that model with everyone here. So we start with the multi-cloud strategy, talking about three tenets of the multi-cloud setup that we have to do. The first is to evaluate your workload. Like assess your workload, distribute them, have a clear guidelines and policy around what kind of workloads to be deployed where and all. We'll deep dive into this again. Once you have decided that this workload needs to be deployed in a certain way, let's say poly cloud or maybe portable cloud or a true distributed cloud, we need to come up with the operating model for them, right? And in operating model, we are going to talk about three key aspects, people, process, and technology. You have to look at operating model across all these three. And the last, once you have that ready and set up, all that is running, now you need to start governing your multi-cloud environment. And you need to have very clear uh, way to govern the multi-cloud environment. And we always say that it should be in a practitioner's view, right? So you make the team aware of governing their own environments and it becomes more prominent in the multi-cloud because you have so many people working on different types of applications across the clouds, right? So it's a key three tenets. The first is evaluate, second is operate, and third is govern. So we are going to look into this very quickly, each one of these. Over to you, Rashmi. Yeah. So starting with the first part of the uh, framework, evaluating your workload. Um, before we start with the workload assessment part of it, we need to understand uh, what are the key architecture patterns when you're building uh, applications in cloud. So uh, we've classified it in, in, in two uh, key architecture patterns. Uh, first one being a cloud agnostic architecture. Uh, so when you're building applications, mostly using, uh, let's say, open source frameworks, for example, uh, you're using uh, Postgres uh, for database, Kafka for messaging, uh, Kubernetes for containers, uh, container orchestration, Docker for containers. Um, uh, basically, you make choices which are available on all cloud uh, providers you make. For example, Kubernetes, if you go with Kubernetes uh, as your uh, container orchestration model, then you have managed Kubernetes of, uh, offerings from each of the cloud providers. So if you are on AWS, you're looking, uh, you are using EKS. Uh, on GCP, you can use uh, GK, which is Google Kubernetes Engine. And on Azure, you can use uh, Azure Kubernetes uh, service. Okay? So these are some of the choices that you make when you are building an application in a cloud agnostic architecture. Uh, when you do that, your, the application becomes portable. So uh, then you're looking at a portable cloud strategy as in uh, it's, a, it's a deliberate way of building an application so that this application is portable across cloud if, when and if there is a need to port this application from one cloud to another so that you are not tied to the underlying cloud platform. The opposite end of the spectrum is cloud specialized architecture, uh, wherein you are making, and again, this is also a deliberate choice when you are making use of 
uh, the, the underlying cloud provider services for building the application. For example, let's say you're building um, uh, an application on AWS, you're making use of AWS Lambdas for serverless, uh, SQS SNS for messaging, uh, Kinesis for streaming, uh, and Fargate for you know, your managed um, Kubernetes, uh, uh, rather managed container orchestration and so on. Um, so, so basically, the, these choices are, are uh, uh, the reason why you would go for this is then you're looking at a polycloud strategy. Uh, you have decided to make the most of all the underlying services that the cloud uh, provides, and you do not want to make this application a cloud agnostic application. Oh, and 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 why is that? Um, so we, we'll talk about that in the next slide. Slide. When do you make these choices, and what are the trade-offs in these choices? Okay. So let's take an example. Uh, so 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 let's take an example of a let's say a telecom company, the the company that I was talking about earlier, for example. So on the x-axis, you have architecture styles. Um, there's a cloud agnostic architecture uh, to cloud specialized architecture. And on the y-axis, you have the criticality of business application. So, you know, sorry, a business criticality of an application uh, from low to high. Okay. So for a typical uh, telecom provider, for example, uh, a network operation related workloads, these are uh, very, very uh, business critical workloads. Uh, you cannot have downtime for these workloads. Uh, where the, these have very, uh, you know, high availability SLAs around these workloads. So while you know, uh, so because of the high availability expectations here, um, when you are looking at building uh, or migrating these applications or modernizing these applications in a multi-cloud environment, uh, you should think of cloud agnostic because you may be able, you may need to set up your DR on another cloud in either in active, active or active passive manner. Uh, so for that, it is important to have a cloud agnostic architecture and not have uh, too much tied with the underlying cloud platform. So uh, that's when you look at a uh, agnostic architecture for a high business critical application. Again, on the other end of the spectrum, let's say you're looking at a promotional website. Um, this is again, uh, you know, it has let's say a medium uh, HA requirements. Um, you, while you do, you you want users to quickly come on your site uh, and look at the promotion. So your time to market is very very quick. And then it makes a lot of sense to make use of underlying cloud specialized services, um, cloud specialized or serverless services to do a very quick go to market of this. And there is, you know, you are not looking at, uh, you know, porting this across clouds because business criticality of this application, while you would, you need this application running, uh, it is still uh, at a lower level as compared to a network operator. That's where you're looking at a cloud specialized architecture. And then another example, order management, uh, this sits in between. Uh, order management is also very critical for a telecom company. But, uh, you know, you, here you could, you know, architecture wise, you could look at uh, not going too much on agnostic or on specialized, but, you know, maybe making use of some of the managed services from the cloud providers, which are available across clouds, like by using managed Kafka, uh, managed Kubernetes or uh, basically, uh, all the services which has uh, complementary services from other cloud providers. But again, there are trade-offs. For example, um, if you are too much on the cloud agnostic side of the architecture, it will give you a lot of flexibility. Um, and on the specialized side, you, it it will do it will uh, entail in lot of vendor lock-in. But there are other trade-offs. For example, uh, the flexibility comes with high efforts and longer timelines, you will take much uh, longer time to do a go-to market of these applications uh, versus on the other side, if you are going with underlying uh, cloud, if you are uh, building applications with a specialized architecture, uh, these are lower efforts, quick turnaround time. But you know, with, with that, that's, that's why this is called as trade-off. With the lower efforts, you get minimum flexibility. With higher efforts, you get maximum flexibility. Uh, so these are some of the guidelines that we suggest to our clients. Again, these are guidelines and they change, they're subject to change for every kind of workload, every kind of uh, client requirements, et cetera. But these are some of the uh, blueprints of guidelines. So let's look at what are the choices that you know cloud providers give us. Uh, I'm taking an example of AWS here. Uh, uh, if you look at, you know, uh, services from AWS, they can be bucketed into three uh, very high-level buckets, self-managed services like EC2, Kafka, Cassandra. 
uh, AWS managed services like uh, Amazon Redshift, Elastic Cash, RDS, etc., and serverless services uh, which like uh, S3, Lambda, DynamoDB, SQS, etc. Uh, again, you know, uh, the uh, going back to the earlier slide, you know, when you make architecture choices um, on the on the uh, two parts, you know, whether you're going to agnostic, whether uh, when you go to agnostic, you're using self-managed services. When you're going uh, on the two specialized side of the architecture, you are making use of serverless services and same trade-offs apply here. Uh, on this side, you have maximum flexibility, but higher efforts. On the other side, you have vendor lock-in, but quick turnaround time. So depending on the kind of workload you have, the kind of HA requirements it has, the criticality of that workload, these choices of architecture and the services that you use differ. So, so how do we help clients to make, make these choices? So this is where our framework comes in. Um, depending on each type of workload, whether it's a business critical uh, consumer facing workload with which very high HA requirements or whether it's a backend workload or a workload being used by uh, maybe these are internal applications, employee applications, or these are some new innovative workloads that you're looking at. Depending on these types of workloads, uh, there are three steps. First is, uh, you know, choose your cloud architecture pattern. Uh, whether you want to go agnostic versus specialized, looking at uh, all the uh, trade-offs that you saw in earlier slide. Uh, make use of the tech stack choice. If you are going to agnostic, then maybe you are somewhere here between self-manage and manage. If you are going to specialize, you are in serverless. Okay? And then finally, the, you will arrive at your multi-cloud deployment model, depending on the choices that you have made. You know, those models could be, for example, if you have gone agnostic with a self-managed stack, then you are looking at a portable cloud option or vice versa. Uh, for example, for specialized serverless, you're looking at a polycloud option. This is how, you know, we have defined uh, a matrix or decision matrix uh, to help our clients to, to choose these options for all the workloads. Uh, so with that, we are done with the first part of the framework, uh, which is evaluation. Uh, again, I'll invite Sunit for the next part, uh, which is the operate. So once we have made the decision on, okay, uh, what kind of workload goes where and all that, now we have to come to the operating model for that, right? In operating model, we talk about three parts. The first part is the people, the organization, teams, its capabilities, how you put them, how you structure them, all that stuff. The second part is your processes, your practices, standard operating procedures, KPIs of governance and tracking and all that stuff. And the third part comes the technology where you define your uh, tech stack, sensible defaults, guidelines, so that every application knows what is their path, right? And how they can be set up, right? So all that three aspects, people, process, and technology needs to be looked at when we are looking at the operating model. And further, I think this is again huge. We have divided into three, but again, we have to look at dividing it further. So we say that, okay, when you're looking at technology, which is the most complex when it comes to the uh, cloud and when it becomes multi-cloud, it, it, it adds up on that, right? So we divide them into, again, four categories, your days infrastructure, your operational infrastructure, your orchestration and integration infrastructure, and application and storage related layer. So these are like four different categories inside the technology. And these are the examples of it, right? So when we are looking at the days infrastructure, how you are going to set up your network, right? How you are going to set up your infrastructure security, right? All your WAF and all that across the edge and everything. When it comes to operational, you have to think about how you are going to monitor and observe your system, how you are going to do the secret management and all that. Third layer, when it comes to orchestration, you need to have your API platform, API gateway, how you are going to manage your queues, your service catalog, container orchestration management, all that stuff. And the fourth layer is where you look at how you're going to manage your application lifecycle, stateful workloads, uh, data databases, object stores, and all that, right? So we divided that into four categories. We need to deep dive again into each of these in respect to multi-cloud. We'll give you some example further. And for the business and processes, we have to look at, okay, how we are going to manage our SLAs across the multiple cloud service provider. What kind of application should have what kind of SLAs? Uh, 
production environment should have surely SLAs, but non-product environment should also have some SLAs, right? What kind of metrics and KPIs we are going to measure, right? Uh, the topmost layer is the people, where you say that how you are going to organize your team and put them across so that you don't have duplication, but you don't have a centralized way of managing also, right? So it has to be thought about that, uh, how you're going to build your uh, skill and technology and capability, right? How you're going to define roles and responsibility. And on top of all of this, your cloud strategy is going to bring a change in the organization. And how you are going to manage this change overall is key. So you need to look at many aspects of people, process, and technology. Let's look at two of them in this session. So the first one is observability and monitoring. And second one is the container management. These are classical two and difficult to manage across multiple cloud service providers. But with the tool and the setups that we have in today, uh, marketplace, I think there are many cloud agnostic tooling available there. So one of the things that we always uh, recommend or we always go for in building our cloud strategy is that having this centralized observability and monitoring. Now the centralized unified observability and monitoring can bring a lot of insights which are co-related, right? Something happened at the infrastructure level and because of that, my transactions reduced. I think this correlation will happen only if you, if you have your business metrics, your infrastructure metrics, all of them are flowing at one place. And if you have multiple cloud service provider, you have to surely think about some solution which is agnostic to uh, the cloud service provider. And when you are defining this, always you should be able to see inside any cloud, any environment, any app from single pane of glass. And that's the key here. Choose any tool, but think about this strategy very carefully. And this is one of the most important part when we are defining the multi-cloud strategy. Also, now the data which is there in the metrics and logs and all that needs to be governed better, right? So you need to think about building a separate account for operational and application data along with your sub-account with IAM policy and all that. And the tools like Datadog and all have similar structure like account management structure that we have in uh, AWS and all the cloud service provider, you'll see that in the Datadog also. So when you push the data, automatically your team will see data only related to your uh, applications. So all, all of that is important as well. Moving on to managing the Kubernetes cluster across CSPs, a lot of tools are available in the market. Rancher was the first one that I was aware of when it started like four or five years back. Google Anthos is like moving very fast in this space where you can manage your Kubernetes cluster across multiple cloud service provider, including on-prem. And if the plan is to move all the workloads to container, this could be a very powerful strategy to go with Google Anthos. And if Google Anthos, Google GCP is in your list of cloud service providers, right? Again, for two examples we have seen, we need to think about all of these individual pieces here and create the blueprint for our organization. Moving on to the last part quickly, once we are set up with evaluating the workload, deciding where, which kind of workload will go, defining the operating model, governance is important, right? Otherwise, it will go out of the hand very soon. Our philosophy is to always have lightweight governance driven by the technology guild, which is more from the practitioner's view. The people who are on the ground are able to fit back to build the policy or the governance for their overall infrastructure. We say here three steps. First, bring real-time insights. Again, real-time insights is key here. You should not have end-of-the-day insights, right? When your application dies, application goes down, you need to know what's happening at the real time. That could be a very powerful tool uh, to get the insights first. Second part is to have the automated governance with fitness functions and alerts. So we don't think about saying that, okay, uh, we'll have reports every month and we'll see where the teams are doing. Have the governance in an automation way with defining the fitness functions. 
third part once you have these two in place why only certain group of people need to do the governance how we can shift this governance to the development team so the team are self governing in a way right so every team knows and govern their cloud cost management for example every team knows that okay what are the security and compliance things that we have to make sure and they have a checklist that they can go through right so all of this again with the unified experience which will help to build the cloud agnostic for example if you are choosing google anthos then they have a config management policy management across cloud service provider but only for kubernetes as of now so that could be a powerful way of linking this governance along with your operating model now for example dora four key metrics is the industry leading uh, way to measure and look at how each teams are doing right and how each applications are doing how frequently we are de uh, deploying so lead time deployment frequency mttr change fail percentage are the key to measure and it can be measured across the teams so now this way we look at all three uh, parts of the uh, overall building the structured way in a structured way building the multi cloud strategy for your organization so the first part that we always uh, talk about is do it only if you need it right so now these three will be given most of the time right i think data center we are moving to cloud so you will first have your cloud set up there and hybrid cloud will be given because you have your workloads running on the data center most of the time and now you are moving the workload so that needs to be connected so this will be given we say that this is not that difficult and can be managed very nicely however once you start and make choices about poly cloud that is still manageable not too difficult but i think leveraging the best of the bread is the way so you are doing your innovation experiment faster time to market with this so there is an advantage there but after this it becomes more and more complex so we caution a lot to our uh clients and that okay build cloud agnostic uh applications don't try to overdo by 100% it's okay to have a 5% duplication there but doing it that way will give you that flexibility as well as ability to move at any point of time right and then comes the distributed cloud for very highly critical applications running across the multiple cloud managed centrally is is the way to go there and that is the most difficult so most of the time we have realized that when in the industry people are talking about multi cloud it is either hybrid cloud or poly cloud sometime it is portable cloud very rare it is distributed cloud and to achieve all of this uh, apply the strategy of three tenets evaluate your workload define the operating model and have the proper governance uh, structure in place that's uh, all from us rashmi you want to add something at the end i think we just have a minute left uh, in case of any questions uh, uh, otherwise you know you can always talk to us in the hangout yep. um uh, thanks sunit and rashmi for a wonderful cloud session so we are exactly on time